not only is this Memorial Weekend, but as the banner behind me indicates, today we also celebrate Ascension Sunday. Let me say right at the beginning of my sermon, the Ascension of Christ is the most underemphasized event in his ministry. In fact, unless you're in a Reformed church this morning, you probably aren't going to even hear it mentioned. The word ascension means rising or going up. Someone asked me, what are you preaching on? I said, well, it's Ascension Sunday. I'm going to be talking about that. Oh, he said, I got a good sermon title for you. I said, what's that? He said, how about Jesus got a raise? <laughs> the ascension announces the departure of Jesus from the earth and his return to God. Christ's ascension is one of the 17 faith confessions we make in the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed, as you know, begins with, I believe in. What does believe mean? What does it mean to believe? What is faith? Without faith, there is no hope. Faith is not a game we play with our minds. Genuine faith has an object. You have to be, you can't have faith in nothing. There must be some content to faith to what we believe. Maybe you've heard someone say, you know, I really don't care what you believe as long as you're sincere. That's not the truth. Try to explain that to a doctor or a nurse who has just given the incorrect medication to a patient who passed as a result. They were sincere. Within the Apostles' Creed are the basis of our faith. I've seen the garden tomb I've been to Golgotha. I spoke to a group of pastors while we sailed across the Sea of Galilee. I've stood on a place outside of Bethany where there's a marker. This is where Jesus ascended. Well, that's, that's nice. But my faith is not built on historic places. The Apostles' Creed says... We believe, and we believe because we are saying what the Bible says. The Apostles' Creed is based upon the tenets of the Bible. We also confess we believe in the Ascension because there's rational evidence for it today. Here we are, 2,000 years after Christ left the earth. He didn't just kind of sneak out quietly, do a few miracles, and then disappear. That's not what happened. Look at your text in Luke chapter 24, and I hope you pick up your Bibles because you can reread these and get to the ones I don't read. Here's what happened. When he had led them out of the vicinity to Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And there are at least 10 biblical references to the ascension. The transformation of the disciples was an undeniable evidence that Christ ascended. Where did these bold men who said they're going to go out and take the world for Christ, where did they come from? These were the same terrified men who became depressed and frightened at the thought that Jesus was going to leave. He had to, on the night of his betrayal, he had to, on the night, tell them, let not your heart be troubled. That word troubled is the word terrified. They were terrified. They fled the night of Christ's arrest. And following his death, they were so convinced that the whole thing is over that Peter said, I'm going fishing. I don't know what you guys are going to do. They said, we're going with you. Approximately 40 days later, these same men, as they had seen the Lord themselves, they had seen this, they were there, it happened. He was leaving them. And he was not going to see them again on this earth. What did these frightened, terrified disciples do? They went to that very sophisticated temple and had an old-fashioned prayer and praise meeting. They believe that change is, again, a rational evidence for us to believe. I believe he ascended into heaven. Now, there, is a, there is a question that is a logical one in the minds of a few. 
since Jesus was going to live forever, why didn't he just stay here? Continue on doing what he was doing. Wouldn't we have a stronger faith if one of these days we are meeting here and Jesus walks in and Pastor Bill says, whoa, you take over. He wants you to preach if you're going to stay here. Or he shows up, Jesus shows up at our 4th of July picnic and he brings not just hot dogs and hamburgers, he brings steak. And along with that, to drink, he's got this great wine. I don't drink wine, but I probably would have had this, the same kind he made at the, at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. Galilee. And here he is. And just before we finish eating, he says, and by the way, if any of you here want to be healed, come on over to the bocce court and I'll heal you. <laughs> now, wouldn't that cause your faith to be stronger than it is this morning? That's a similar question that I, I'm not going to have time to get into. But this is the same question, basically, a similar question that was raised among the new Jewish Christians. Jesus was gone. They had forsaken everything they used to do in the temple with their sacrifices and their fest festive days and their celebrations. They threw that all out to follow Christ. And now, time has passed. He's not around. Jesus, their Messiah, is gone. And they said, we got to go back to the temple worship. A man, I don't know his name, was inspired in the first century to write a book in the Bible to deal with that question of the defecting Jewish Christians going back to faith, to their faith in the Old Testament. I don't know the name of the gentleman who wrote it. All I know is that he was a man because the book is called Hebrews, not Shebrews. <laughs> and I wish I could go into this, but the book of Hebrews was written to answer the questions of these individuals who thought Jesus retired or something. When Jesus went back to God the Father, he ascended, and his job description was changed. He finished the assignment on earth and was given a promotion, which is this. Listen to this. Christ's promotion was to the advantage of every believer. The theme of the book of Hebrews is the superiority of the ascended Christ. The writer is telling these doubting new Christians, don't go back to that faith. Look at Hebrews 4, 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. In his new position as high priest, Jesus offers the most comforting promise we could ever find. He says, now, he is not only operating where he is visible, he is operating everywhere he is because he's in heaven. Look at verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We pray, when we pray, our high priest who resides in the very presence of God, Jesus himself prays for us in a way with words that we can never express. Just think that simple prayer that you have. God doesn't hear it that way. He hears it with all the embellishments that Jesus might give it when he prays. So, he says in Hebrews 
chapter 7. Don't go back. Don't go back, you Jewish Christians. Because unlike the priests in the past, died, he lives forever. Verse 23. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them, since death prevented them from continuing office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. And this new group, as a result of the writing of Hebrews and, of course, the work of the Holy Spirit, they were transformed, and they grasped the fact that Jesus was now at the right hand of God. He's the priest making decisions for them. So as I said, the importance of the ascension of Christ cannot be overstated. And I'll just take time to read one quotation here. It's the strongest statement for the ascension that I have ever read, and it's so strong that he makes a little bit of apology saying, I may have, may have misled you a bit, but let me read it. Here's what, and some of you read Dr. R.C. Sproul, by the way, he just passed away. <clears throat> a Reformed theologian says this, I come right to the rim of heresy when I say this. In terms of biblical teaching of the kingdom of God, the ascension, not the resurrection, is the ultimate in Christian history. Now, he, he, he says, I'm, I'm bordering on heresy, I know. And, and I don't want to be dogmatic about it. But he's saying the ascension of our Lord stands right alongside the resurrection. And I don't have time to embellish that. But just think of that. What would the resurrection have been without the ascension? The limitations as a result. Okay, final words are important, and we looked at Luke's account uh, earlier of the ascension. He also wrote the book of Acts, as you know. He begins with the history of early church, and he writes the final words that Jesus made to his disciples, and that's an assignment that he gave them, an assignment that he gives to every disciple who will follow him. It's big. But, with the assignment, notice, comes the necessary equipment to fill it. Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the art, or ends of the earth. Then, right after he gives this commission, great commission, notice the next verse. And he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And together with the coming of the Holy Spirit and our Lord's position at the right hand of God interceding, all disciples from that day on, and I trust that includes us, are equipped to go as witnesses into all the world with the message of Christ. I'll take a cut here. Uh, well, uh, the angels that had, this is a story, but the angels that had been on the hillside when Christ was born and they sang, remember, a multitude of heavenly hosts singing. When Christ ascended, the story is that a group of them were concerned. They had seen him when he was born, Jesus, what did you do these 33 years when you were down there on earth? And Jesus said, I told the people that they would be called witnesses. My final words to the disciples were a reminder that they were to tell others the message of eternal life, and everyone who received it was also to become a witness. This way, Jesus says, the whole world would hear that God loves them and has a wonderful plan for their life. There was silence. The silence was interrupted when one of the angels asked the key, the key question. But, Jesus, what if they don't go and tell your message 
like you told them to. And Jesus answered, I have no other plan. That's it. You, we, do it, or it isn't going to get done. Now, praise God, we're doing something in Kenya and uh, Sierra Lo Lo Salone, alone, Sierra Leone. You know, the other part of Africa. <laughs> Sierra Leone, that's it. And uh, elsewhere. And I hope in the midst of this, we won't forget a very needy field. We'll also go to that place called the villages. Let's pray. Lord, just as you told your disciples, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Help us to do as you did, and as you sent out reapers, may we be among them. In Jesus' name, amen.